Yeah, so I'm from a small island in Georgian Bay, um, full of Anishinaabe folks. I come from um, a really large family. I'm the youngest of 18 kids, and we have like over 100 nieces and nephews, great nieces and nephews, great great nieces and nephews now because we love to have children because um, children are the center of our universe as Anishinaabe, which will probably come up a bit in my talk. So I just want to launch right in. I have 30 minutes. I'm going to talk to you about liquid love and dreams in terms of decolonizing the museum. And somewhere between what I say and the images are the strategies. And we can dive deeper into those in the question period. But I just want to say I'm open to any kind of question and never fear, I am here. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm going to take a minute to put on my, uh, my presentation. I want to say that I'm also, my form of a land acknowledgement is to say that I stand in solidarity with all of the First Nations um, in both of our territories, all of our territories of everyone who's on this call in their struggles for self-determination, for sovereignty, and in their work to protect the land and the water and the health, of, health and love of their communities. All right. Hope it's working. So um, I use the terminology of centering, centering indigenous knowledge, ways of being, philosophies, spirit, languages, worldviews, values, and traditions. Decolonization and indigenization might be effects of this centering. I don't know why it's, oh, here. Now I can do it might be effects of this centering, but are not what I'm aiming at. I am aiming at self-determination and sovereignty of our peoples. In the museum context, I aim at what is currently our desires and how it is expressed within art, how artists and the field as a whole is supported by my work with an eye towards our futures. I will speak from decolonization towards what I see as my actual project. I will couch our look at art in terms of liquid love and dreams in order to give some ideas to you as starting places. And as I said before, in between the image and my words are the strategies. It's fun for me to do it this way because I, I talk about this in all different kinds of ways, um, but it's not final, it's not complete um, in terms of the work I do or the projects of equitable museums. So what you're looking at here is um, an event uh, called Art in the Language um, that was one of the th first things I hosted at um, the Art Gallery of Ontario where I work, which is the largest museum in Canada. So imagine a full city block. It's a, it looks like a big kind of ship or a big whale. It's quite beautiful if you've never been. Um, and this space is Walker Court. So it's the heart of the colonial building that the Art Gallery of Ontario is built from, on top of and around. So thinking about space in terms of, it's the actual center of the building and it's what you come into when you enter the space. Um, so elders here are speaking in their language and um, you'll see, here's one of the elders down in the right-hand corner, uh, Shirley Williams. And Shirley Williams um, is, one of the, is one of the elders that's at the forefront of language revitalization, Anishinaabe language revitalization. Um, she worked really hard to hold on to her language through the project of cultural genocide and assimilation that is residential schools. And I think in the States, they call them industrial schools, but it's the same, same idea. And um, here she's speaking with a few, a uh, number of elders and an artist, Robert Houle, who's in the blue jacket. And Robert Houle's work is framing um, this uh, space. So you see these drums that are up on the, close to the ceiling. 
there's there are seven of them and they are the seven grandfathers which is kind of forms the backbone of Anishinaabe philosophy it's our value system love is one of those values humility courage bravery all these things are I form a kind of back, uh, backbone to our value system and how we raise our kids and also how we kind of figure out how to live a good life. So one of the things um, that happens when you are an Indigenous person in an institution is you have relationships with Indigenous folks. And so Robert and I have a relationship. And so we were talking about this work and he said, well, you know, they've never been activated. And in, in, in our culture, uh, drum is not alive until it's feasted by the community, by people you invite. And that essentially brings the spirit of the drum to life. So from his point of view, it hadn't happened. And these had been up already uh, for a couple of years and no one had ever asked him and he wasn't gonna press the issue because he didn't want it to be a cultural spectacle. He wanted it to come from a real place of engagement. And so we had a conversation about this and one of the ways that he wanted to activate it was through the jingle dress and through the drum. And we added in this conversation because part of how I see my work is to challenge kind of dogma around indigenous art as well. So one of the dogma is there are no words for art in our languages. And I think that's, true in the sense that you can't translate art to our, to our language, but we have so many ways of thinking about what art is and what kinds of art we have created for millennia. And also it roots us in the idea that our art is the oldest art of this land. And so our history should start from there. Um, for, I'm gonna, so this was at the McLean Center for Indigenous and Canadian Art opening. So it becomes something that we always do now. We always have to have a drum going in that room. Um, so you make a commitment to these things and the sound of the drum reverberating through all the European galleries that are on that floor is also part of what was happening that I found um, quite profound. And who knows what the spirit of that drum is doing inside those paintings and inside those rooms and inside of the bodies of folks who are sitting there. For a colonized people, the most essential value, because it's the most concrete, is first and foremost the land, the land which will bring them bread and above all dignity. And that's Franz Fanon, Wretched of the Earth. So these are my two pillars. The other one, the other quote, this time has come, the time has come, Water is something we cannot negotiate, something we cannot compromise. It is seemingly abundant, but in reality, it is in grave danger. And my duty as a woman is to defend our water and to protect life. Water is life. And that's Nina Waste, who's Lakota Dakota Cree, and one of the founders of the Idle No More movement, to which I was an organizer for three years of my life and still work in some ways. Um, but now I take that kind of uh, framework and I bring it inside a museum instead of into the streets. Um, this is a work by Rebecca Belmore, just to say also that um, here's an actual experience of bringing liquid into the museum where she wanted to place clay on stone. That's the title of the piece, Clay on Stone. And she wanted to create this huge abstract painting with an organic material that wouldn't stay, that would disappear, would be, is, um, would be washed away. And she's tributing Robert Houle, um, the senior artist whose drums we had just talked about, um, and tributing the framework from which he works from, which is abstraction. And she does this with her body in a very different way. So also thinking about, um, liquid as a way of um, liquid is something that always kind of forms into a container it fills a container um, but it's something fluid it's something non-rigid it's not something solid it is always flexible adaptable and open to a kind of vulnerable vulnerability 
it can dissipate, it can evaporate, it can do all kinds of things. And in this work, the water is meant to evaporate so that the painting is only finished once it's dry. And that's in real time. And this was done durationally over a 12 hour period from dusk to dawn, um, again, in the center of the building. So we're kind of trying to transform Walker Court, which is the colonial center into Anishinaabe Walker Court. <laughs> so it's going to be filled with our value system. Um, and hopefully that will reverberate th out through the building. Um, so this is a work by Rebecca Belmore called Fountain, which was made for um, Venice Biennale in 2005 when she was representing, and I'll put in quotes, this is representing as solid thinking, representing Canada as the first First Nations woman. Again, solid thinking. She chooses to speak to water um, which could be attributed to her identity in terms of being Anishinaabe. As Anishinaabe, we are kind of caretakers of water. Um, but that's not where she takes it. She goes into a fluid space in the way she speaks from the specific to the universal. Um, she wants to talk about a world war on water. And in 2005, she saw forward and thought one day with the way that we operate as human beings on this earth, that water will be the thing we fight over. And I think that that is becoming super more clear now. But at the time, um, she takes this bucket in the, in the performance, um, in the video, and she takes water out and she struggles and she throws it against the screen. And as the screen hits the water, as the water hits the screen, it turns blood, turns to blood. And so you can imagine these Italians <laughs> at the time who aren't thinking about water at all. And you're in Venice and you see, even if you go there today, I drop tobacco in the water all the time because I'm so sad for her and how dirty she is and how mistreated she is. And um, they just kept asking themselves like, why is she throwing blood at us? We have nothing to do with colonization. <laughs> so they couldn't understand their own connection to this issue of water yet because of uh, the way their society has developed has really divorced them from that relationship in their own history. Um, so um, I feel like this work was way ahead of its time and it didn't worry about being liked. It's literally liquid, which creates an excess in the building, um, a building made for paintings and solid objects, sculpture. And um, because it's a flowing fountain in the space, they had to figure out where all this excessive moisture is gonna go. So one venue on our tour couldn't show it because it was too close to a Picasso, even though the Picasso was in another room. And so there you, you have the inauguration of the traditional hierarchy of art, painting first, and the focus on video performance and installation does challenge the boundaries of the encyclopedic museum, both as form and content. So blood into water, water into blood. It is a motion of transformation that interests this artist. As she throws water, which turns to blood and it hits the screen, the screen goes blank and all you have is the water running. I was thinking a lot about liquid as life as the very essence of life and um, the way in which museums don't really treat their staff as humans, you know, <laughs> but as workers. And it was fascinating to watch the staff continually go and gather in this room to meditate on their breaks. They always felt really relaxed in this space, um, even though the content is quite, you know, intense. And that was because of the water itself, the actual organic material. So negative ions exist wherever there is water, wherever water's colliding, like in a waterfall or a fountain. Um, and that has positive effects, which have been, we knew for forever, but you know, science now shows <laughs> that it elevates mood and it reduces depression. So these are some of the kind of ways in which a single artwork can have multiple effects and also multiple ways that we have to think about who we are inside of a museum. So even my body as a boundary or as a solid, that's what we focus on all the time, my identities or, or the, the, the line of my skin. 
Um, but really, if you look beneath that, it's all water and it's all flow of energy. So how can we think about that differently? And the drum is one place where that happens. I was in a event one time with an Inuit, uh, an Inuk uh, man, elder, and he was using their drum, which is different than ours. Um, and he said the reverberation of the drum, once it hits your flesh, um, is meant to make you feel it dissipate. So you can no longer see, feel the, the separation of your flesh from the air around it. And it completely transformed the way I think about the world when I had that experience of that particular drum and stopped seeing myself as superbly separate. So the prefix de in decolonization means to remove, reduce, and or produce the opposite of colonization. And this is a production of the opposite. It seems the first step would be to understand colonization as the theft of land and liberty from indigenous peoples. This connects any person, this connects any process of decolonization to the prefix re, R-E. For the reason, for this reason, decolonization means let giving land and liberty back <laughs> to indigenous people. It also means um, letting indigenous people lead that process. Decolonization is a word to describe a large number of processes of restoration, reparation, and restitution of indigenous lands, bodies, cultures, and communities. It encompasses healing oneself, by unlearning toxic stereotypes and historical lies. It also means changing social, economic, political and legal structures. And we will talk about why this matters in the context of the museum. My goal is to inhabit this world as a free human without oppression or hindrance, to live as Anishinaabe in my own lands, with my language, with my community and with my culture intact such that I can pass it to my children, my grandchildren, a future where my culture is not ossified in the binary of pre-contact and colonized, where transformation, freedom of movement and chance, which are Anishinaabe values, rather than authenticity, unchanging tradition, stasis and predictability, are the basis of my worldview. And that's the colonial side. So the other part of liquid is that um, indigenous land is often thought of as a solid within you know, private property concepts, um, land claims, this kind of thing. But what we're really, when you're flying above it, whether you're in astral travel or in a plane, you can tell that the land is mostly water. It's very liquid, it's very fluid. Um, there are no straight lines. The only straight lines you will see are logging roads and mining roads and town roads, all the incursion of colonialism. Um, so decolonization involves unlearning and changing the base of colonialism in the concepts of private property, manifest destiny, discovery, enlightenment, Eurocentrism, Cartesian dualism, which separates mind from body, doesn't even include the spirit, heteropatriarchy, capitalism, positivism, sexism, racism, individualism, extraction. And I mean that in all ways, both knowledge, plant and earth, um, mineral, classicism, violence and control. And these are only to name a few. I mean, we could spend a long time filling this up. But what it means is that these things, these are what we need to study in order to understand how not to re repopulate them within the work we do in the museum. And this is an image of that. <laughs> so this is called Edifice by Michael Belmore. And an edifice is both the kind of, you know, the, the front of a major building like our parliament. An edifice is also the kind of belief system that gives rise to something. So like capitalism, you know, it's the, the edifice of um, the beliefs that give rise to the edifice of capitalism. And for us, we're talking about how these things are interlinked with colonialism. So all of these are edifices of the same system that we all exist in. That's why it's not just an indigenous issue. Um, but here he has flowing through it is a um, 
copper. And copper in the Anishinaabe worldview is a um, is basically the blood of the Thunderbird. And the Thunderbird is the being that travels between the spirit realm and the earthly realm and has, you know, up in Northern Ontario, you can go see in Thunder Bay, you can go see their nests. They're, they're nesting on Lake Superior. There's also some nests in the States because we don't care about the border. Um, and so he's put that in there as a way to kind of signal that while all of this is happening, the, there is all this life and all this power that's coming cracking through and breathing through um, at the same time. So um, decolonization should challenge all that is thought to be proper and normal in current settler colonial states. Decolonization should challenge that. Museums are solid in their focus on objects rather than process, connection, and the flow across the borders of outside and inside. This is a work by Winsome who um, is Afro-Indigenous. Um, it was an installation called I Rise um, in 2019. And here you see there's a bowl of water with a crystal in it. And this small red bench uh, had a slot in it and you could write down love notes or memories to somebody who had passed away. And all of those, um, everybody would come in and you could put those inside the box and they would join everybody else's love notes to um, those who had passed away. And this is the altar. So I would come through the gallery all the time and I would see people praying at this altar, all different kinds of people. It didn't matter what religion, didn't matter where you come from. Um, and it really, um, Winsome really taught me something about the way in which a museum could be a space of spiritual transformation. Um, if you can get people around the idea of having a bowl of water and having a bunch of dirt <laughs> and all kinds of things that, <laughs> that are hard to um, deal with through security and audiences, um, but really, really, no one messed with this piece, not one person, because of the content of it, because they can tell what it is, you know, they can tell that this is something spiritual happening here, that you don't want to mess with that, right? You wouldn't go into church and, and start messing with, well, maybe you would, I, I might, but you know, generally you shouldn't, <laughs> if you're going to be respectful. <laughs> um, but also what's part of this is, um, liquid and this notion of intergenerational trauma um, that often artists leads us down this path of spirit and allowing for prayer and grief in the gallery. Um, and that is one of the ways in which decolonization happens. So love. So part of the expression of love lies in our ceremonies and political movements. Here um, is Here is one from taking something from Idle No More, which I referenced earlier and bringing it inside the gallery. So one of the main forms for the Idle No More movement, which also hit the States, uh, was the round dance, where everyone kind of joins hands and dances in a, in a circle and songs are sung. This movement was about protecting the water. And we wanted to connect um, the exhibition of Rebecca Belmore's work to the movements that were happening across um, the nation, because uh, this is where we both stand. This is who we are. Um, and these things aren't separate from each other, um, the inside and the outside to the real political movements and bringing their form straight into the gal gallery also bring the people that that form speaks to. So it brought in a whole slew of folks from, and people traveled by bus, they came by train just to be here for this, um, round dance because it never been performed inside the gallery before and they knew what it what it signified in terms of unification between the struggles of the people and the work of the artist which is something Rebecca is really deeply um, tied to it also speaks to the emotional space of the museum and this is something that um, I believe de decolonial work is it has to be about too um, is the affect, our bodies, the emotion side of life. So the round dance represents 
a young girl who was grieving for her mother and uh, her mother had passed away and she couldn't stop grieving. And so it was affecting everybody. It was affecting the community and they hurt for her. Um, so she went away and this dance um, came to her and it was brought back to the community and they were to perform it collectively all together to turn her grief into celebration. And so thinking about the fact that we carry all this grief, you know, 500 years of grief, um, the museum can't just um, get rid of that. It's part of that grief. It's part of the process of that, uh, what has caused that grief. And so therefore the processes of alleviating that grief also have to be part of museum work. So de decolonization involves the centering of indigenous ways of being, knowing and loving. As Anishinaabe Kwe, it's my responsibility to care, take care of that earth and her lifeblood, the water, and to nourish the many generations to come. Without the return of land bases, we will not be able to get out of poverty. And the sculpture that you see here, these two sculptures, tower and tarpaulin, are directly about poverty, directly about homelessness. So to think that we keep building towers up as very few people are, as more and more people are living under blankets on the street. There's more to this than that, but I'm going to go quickly. Um, so our poverty is a direct policy of colon colonialism and led to the wealth of today's West, all of it. Why we have to build museums, um, it's why we have to build museums that the poor want to be in and can afford. The culture of poverty and working class and underemployed needs to be taken into account when deciding what is proper behavior in a museum. At the same time, looking at art of the wealthy and powerful, say in historical parts of the museum in Canadian and American wings can often feel violent to some audiences, like an affirmation of the status quo and a victory dance of the settlers. This is not love. Reframing these works can sometimes help get underneath them. What does a portrait of a powerful person serve? What are the effects of its exhibition? What happens when you place it with other work um, by contemporary indigenous artists? Landscapes function in a similar way. Land bases, I did a land claim in the building of our art gallery um, so that the space um, is kept growing for where indigenous art could be, where, <laughs> where you could exhibit it and what was designated um, for it. Uh, and part of that is, is to take a kind of political structure, which is the, the segregation of indigenous people onto reservations and say that it's still happening in our cultural structures as well. And we have to undo that segregation and undo also the fact that reservations were about shrinking down our land bases smaller and smaller. So we also can't do that in the museum. This is a work that you're looking at by Tanya Lucan Linklater, who's paying tribute to Rita Latond and uh, G Georgiana Uliaric is on the call here and she's uh, my colleague at the AGO and co-curated this exhibition, Fire and Light, with me. Um, and then we had invited um, Tanya to do a performance and she in turn invited these two dancers to uh, perform tribute to, to Rita Latond's paintings. So I chose Rita Latond uh, when the director asked me to say, he's like, if you had a space tomorrow and you want to do a solo show, who would it be? I didn't realize he literally meant tomorrow, which meant it had to be like fast. <laughs> but I'm definitely somebody who can take advantage of an opportunity at any moment. So I said Rita Latond. Um, I knew that she was going to be 90 and I knew that she had been working from the 40s. She's an Abenaki uh, abstract painter um, who was part of a huge group of men, you know, had had her moment at a certain period of time and um, hadn't really had a moment since. Um, and definitely when she came out, her the fact that she was a woman and the fact that she was indigenous went against her. But now here we are making those things work for her. And we translated the text into her, um, her indigenous language. And part of it was to, to help also make it clear that we're not in the same time anymore. 
So she had to hide her indigeneity to be bought by museums and we don't have to do that anymore. So she could be fulsomely herself um, in this exhibition. And also she was going blind. And I wanted her to see her last show, her big show before, you know, she couldn't see it anymore. Um, so these are some of the things that we think about. This is an indigenous value that runs contrary to artworks, that runs contrary to the art world. This notion of tributing, paying homage to our elders um, with love and real emotion um, and doing it through affective forms like dance and performance. Um, it's not the same as saying like, I'm influenced by, or this is an amazing artist. That's not the same thing. It means tears, laughter, sensuality, rage, love. All of this is inside the Decolonial Museum. Dreams. So this is a work by Robert Houle, Shaman, Dream in Color. And it comes after, um, there was a, in 2008, there was an apology from the Canadian government to indigenous folks, survivors of the residential school system. And um, sadly it happened on my birthday, which I still really hate. Um, <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't want to engage himself in this process in either the apology or in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And um, as the apology came out, he started drawing automatically, automatic drawing. And um, it was about his memories were coming back, you know? So he thought he had dealt with his residential school experience, but he hadn't dealt with a lot of what had, he had experienced that he had blocked out of his memory. So the act of drawing was an act of bringing out those memories such that they could be dealt with. But this work comes after that. So at the point at which he, he, he found a concept in his own culture, he found that he, uh, he started painting in his own language because he realized he'd been painting in English all his life, like talking to himself in English. And then as he re started talking to himself in, in his own language, his work started to shift and change as well. And the shamans, these shaman paintings came out first and their, their title is Shaman Dream in Color, Shaman Never Die. It's all about the way in which that tenacity, that resistance, the way in which these things have never died and they weren't able to be genocided completely. Um, so artists are part of this dreaming much like the shaman were. And there's a lot of work being done now to think about um, the shamanistic qualities of artistic production. Dream and language. So following from what Robert had realized, um, we started translating um, exhibition and permanent gallery spaces into uh, the language of the land, which is Anishinaabemowin. So here you have Anishinaabemowin, and then you have English, and then you have French, um, all equal, but Anishinaabe is first because we are first <laughs> on this land and that always has to be acknowledged. Um, that's why the title of the department is Indigenous and Canadian because Indigenous is first. <laughs> Have to keep saying it. Um, so some of the aspects of this, it's a land acknowledgement, but it's more than that. Um, I was interested in the translation of art language into our, into our language where are the spots where something is untranslatable? Where are the spots that are gonna be like, we have to develop a new word? So in a way, it's a, it's a gift to be able to expand our language and make it really relevant for any context because we weren't writing museum texts when we were you know, hanging out. So I think that if developing the language in that area is also one way that the museum is contributing to indigenous language as a whole. Um, we're paying elders to do this work and to work through the language. And I'm now the second phase of this, I want to bring the elders and language speakers together to dissect the texts and to talk about cultural difference. Like what, where is it? So for example, um, one of the concepts that comes all the time up all the time in Western art thinking is the unconscious. We don't have a concept of the unconscious. All the psychoanalytic term terminology that comes up in art speak 
doesn't translate into an Anishinaabe way of thinking. And I find that awesome. I'm like, I love psychoanalysis. So I just love that this is like, you know, part of my world. And then, you know, words like poetry, like we don't have a word for poetry because the language itself functions as poetic all the time. So there was no need for a separate word like that. So these are all the things we're learning. Um, and we want to dream in our language. You know, we want to create in our language. Lastly, dreams is a method. It's not just a metaphor. A valid way of producing knowledge. This is an indigenous concept. So here's a room that came to me in a dream. I'll show you the whole room first. Well, it's not like the best images. I should have taken my own photography. <laughs> um, so this work that you see here, um, that looks like a white blanket with a chair and a line of blood um, on top of the chair. This work is normally, according to the artist Rebecca Belmore, supposed to be in a room all by itself. It's called Blood in the Snow and it's supposed to be in complete silence. So obviously my dream is telling me to mess with her idea of her own artwork <laughs> because it wanted to be in the room with these other works. And I trust my dreams. I generally curate through dreams. Um, that's often how a room will get finished. It's often how a room gets constructed. It's often how I'll do a checklist. Um, and it's a hard thing to kind of talk about in a way, but I feel like I need to start talking about it more. So in the end, when she trusted me because we have a long relationship, we have a deep trust relationship. Um, I didn't choose her because she's an art star or anything like that. Um, so when we had all the work together, we realized that all of these pieces deal with the 1800s very specifically. Like they all have historical references. So Blood in the Snow deals with the Wounded Knee Massacre. Um, the paperworks on the wall deal with um, the late 1800s, are, deal with the very first um, Prime Minister of Canada who's the architect of residential schools. And then this video work that you, I can't show you because they didn't take a picture of both sides, um, deals with um, uh, March 5th, 1819, when um, a young indigenous woman was stolen from her community um, by settlers as a gesture of goodwill because they wanted to learn more about, <laughs> about them. But in the process, um, they killed her husband and uh, her, her child died very soon after as well. And she became like a major figure in um, historical writing. But as Rebecca says, it's like one line, right? In a textbooks that you might read, but no sense of her life as a, as a human being, as part of a community who was in love, a new mother. And so she places these people in contemporary dress to acknowledge that these things are continuing. And then you stand between it because you're a witness. And so witnessing was also part of all these works. So now I trust my dreams greatly in terms of where it's going um, and why certain works, I may not be able to consciously say it, but why they might be there. So, and also how we trust, how we learn to trust um, in a different way, our working relationships. So we are asserting our sovereignty over our bodies, communities and lands today, even though this is precarious and often illegal. Every drum, song, painting, installation, and performance is an act of freedom aimed at an Indigenous future. Our collective traumatic past still contains the seeds for times we have not yet lived. Futures that are dreamings instead of the horrible hauntings of colonization. So I'll end it there. <laughs>